This is the ultimate beginner's guide to Sea of Thieves. I broke up this video into each topic I'll cover, so check out the timestamps in the comments and in the description if you want to find a certain topic. If you're a new PlayStation player, then you're in the right place. But first, a word from our sponsor. Just kidding, there is no sponsor. In my hands, I hold a working blunderbuss, and I offer you a choice. You can either hit that subscribe button right now, or I will come plunder your booty. The choice is yours. I'm Captain Squiddy, and I'm currently the biggest Sea of Thieves YouTuber on console. That's right, I only have 3,000 subs, and I'm literally the biggest YouTuber on console. So welcome home, my console brothers. Every other channel you'll find on here is a PC player, but if you want to see PS5 beginner guides from someone who actually plays on a controller, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You should also join my Discord linked in the description. And now let's get right into it. Here's everything you need to know before starting Sea of Thieves. I hope you like balls, because in today's video, we're getting up close and personal with each and every one. From chain shot to cursed balls, there's a lot of different ammo types to choose from. In this video, I'm going to explain every type of cannonball in Sea of Thieves, and I'll show you how to use them to win more fights. The first ammo type is you. You can launch yourself out of the cannon, which is the best way to board an enemy ship. This is a great skill to practice and will make you much better at boarding consistently. But remember that you are much heavier than a cannonball, so you'll need to aim the cannon much higher than you normally would. The best form of cannon launching is called the deck shot. This is when you manage to land perfectly on the top deck of the enemy ship. It's one of the most impressive things you can do during a fight. Beat your enemies in style. Next we have chain shot. This is definitely the most important ammo type. You never want to waste any of this. Don't fire chain shot unless you're close enough to the other ship to know it will hit. You really want to save chain shot for very special opportunities. This ammo type has the power to one-shot break masts on brigs and galleons. However, it will only make two cracks on the mast of a sloop. You usually don't want to fire chain shot while your enemy is firing cannonballs at you. You want to make sure you knock the enemy off cannon or wait until they don't have angle on you before you start trying to drop their mast with chain shot. Chain shot is definitely the most valuable tool to use when fighting a larger ship. But remember that chain shot has much less range than a cannonball. It travels slower and drops faster, which is why you usually want to be very close to your target if you're running out of it. Next, let's talk about cursed cannonballs. Cursed balls are green if they affect players, and they are purple if they affect ships. You can hold up to 5 cursed balls at once. The grog ball applies the drunk effect on players for a few seconds. This will make the player's vision blur, and it will make them sway left and right uncontrollably until they throw up. The swaying effect will make it impossible for them to fight, repair, or bucket their ship. The limp ball applies a limping effect on players. It will break their leg and make them move really slow. This is mostly useful if you can board your opponent in time to capitalize on it. The weary ball is one of the strongest cursed balls. This will make players perform the sleep emote for a few seconds, completely blocking them from doing anything whether it's shooting back at you or repairing their ship. This can be very effective for finishing off a ship that you know is close to sinking. The jig ball makes players perform the dance emote for a few seconds. This is basically the same as the weary ball in that it stops them from doing anything while they're affected. The Venom Ball will give the same effect as being bitten by a snake. While the enemy is poisoned, their screen will turn dark purple, which can be blinding if you do it at night. Their health will also start degenerating by 5 every second for a few seconds. Now let's move on to the Purple Cursed Balls, which will affect ships instead of players. The Anchor Ball will drop your enemy's anchor on impact. The ability to stop their ship suddenly by surprise will make this one of the most useful Cursed Balls for naval combat. Once the anchor ball lands, you'll probably want to drop their mast immediately. This way you force them to choose between catching their mast or raising their anchor back up. The peace ball will raise your enemy's cannons and lock them in the highest position while cursed. This ball can instantly turn a broadside in your favor. After peace balling the enemy cannons, you want to take advantage of it immediately by chain shotting the enemy mast. You can also use peace balls defensively by saving them until your mast goes down. This will give you an easy escape because you can raise your mast without it getting knocked back down again. The helm ball will lock up your enemy's wheel, forcing it to stay how it was turned on impact. The wheel will have purple smoke around it until the effect is done. The best time to use a helm ball is if you're dominating on a broadside, and you want to stop your enemy from being able to turn away from you and escape. The ballast ball makes a ship sail lower in water, causing it to fill faster from second level hull damage. This means that a sloop and brigantine will take in water from holes in the back of the ship, 
and a galleon will take in water from mid-deck holes. If your enemy has been neglecting patching all their holes, then they will suddenly sink very fast from a ballast ball. The rigging ball will completely raise your enemy's sails. You want to save this for special opportunities where you need to stop your enemy from escaping. The main use for it is for stopping the enemy from raising a broken mast. If they're in the middle of trying to pull up their mast, the rigging ball will instantly make it fall all the way back down. The barrel ball will block your enemies from accessing their storage barrels for a short time. Unfortunately, the effect doesn't last very long, so this is probably the worst of all the cursed balls. You're really just going to annoy your enemies with it. Now let's talk about the three types of ghostly cannonballs. The phantom cannonball functions like a normal cannonball. However, the benefit of these is that you can hold five in addition to your ten normal cannonballs. Similarly, flame phantom cannonballs will function just like firebombs. The last ghostly cannonball is the most powerful ammo type in the game. The Wraith Ball. Wraith Balls explode on the enemy ship like a powder keg. They open up multiple holes and deal splash damage to players. Wraith Balls are simply powerful, and they will win you fights. Next, we have Fire Bombs. These are mostly useful when fighting against a Galleon. If you shoot fire on their top deck, it will quickly spread out of control, and will be very hard for them to put out. However, fire is much less effective against sloops or brigs. Its main use is going to be against Galleons. Next, we have the Skeleton Collar. This will spawn skeletons on the enemy ship. These skeletons will be friendly to you, but hostile to the enemy. The Skeleton Collar is useful for distracting the enemies while your crew is trying to board them. It can also be useful for forcing the enemy to exit their cannons during a broadside, so they can deal with all the skeletons. Now let's talk about the standard cannonball. This is obviously the main ammo type you should use when fighting in a broadside. It is the power to one-shot kill your enemies, open up holes, and even do damage to the wheel, mast, or anchor if you're accurate. This is the ammo you should be using to open fights with. Next, we have blunder bombs. These are for killing players or knocking them off your ship. You should fire these out of your cannon to interrupt enemies while they're trying to raise their mast, patch holes, or bucket water. These can be very useful for when you're death spiraling an enemy ship. Blunder bombs also have the ability to actually turn the enemy ship in the water if you fire them at the hull. This can be useful for making an enemy ship lose angle on you. Next we have Scattershot. This is a new ammo type in Season 12. Like Chain Shot, Scattershot is greatly limited by range, but if you're close enough, Scattershot will fire four small cannonballs all over the enemy ship, opening four Tier 1 holes. I hope you're hungry because in today's video, I'm giving you the ultimate guide to food in Sea of Thieves. There are four categories of food items in the game. Fruit, meat, fish, and bait. Fruit is the main healing item in Sea of Thieves. Here's every type you can find. Bananas heal 20 health, coconuts heal 30, pomegranates heal 40, mangoes heal 50, and finally, the pineapple is the rarest fruit, giving you two separate bites for 100 health each. So 200 health total, making a pineapple 10 times better than a banana. The best place to find rare fruit is in outpost barrels, fortresses, sea forts, and storage crates washed up on beaches. Next, let's talk about meat. Raw meat is useless, but cooked meat will give you 50 health per bite, and it will store 25 health regeneration. You can hunt animals and monsters for meat as you explore the world. If you look on islands, you'll find pigs and chickens and snakes, which all drop one piece of meat. If you look in the ocean, you can kill sharks and megalodons and even the Kraken to get meat. And of course you can go fishing too, even while you sail. Megalodon and Kraken meat is the rarest, so it gives 100 health instead of 50, and it stores up 50 health regen instead of only 25. You can also find meat inside the flesh of other players, but this is usually frowned upon. Now let's learn how to cook. To cook your meat, simply put it on the stove at the bottom of your ship. Your meat will only change color twice before it's done. It will go from raw to a light tan, and finally it will turn fully brown around the edges when it's done. But remove it quickly or else it will burn. If your food burns, it will become useless and it will start a fire on your ship. A trick for knowing when fish is fully cooked is that the eyes will turn white. Meat is the hardest food to come by, but it's the best for PvP. Meat offers two special advantages for helping you fight other players. The first is that cooked meat lets you save up 25 health regeneration per bite. So eating two full pieces of meat lets you save up a full 100 health, which will regenerate whenever you aren't taking damage. The second way meat helps with PvP is by giving you two bites instead of one. 
Food inventory space is very limited, which is why you want meat and pineapples to basically double your inventory space, by giving you twice as many healing bites. If you're too lazy to hunt for meat or cook it, the best place to find cooked meat is by visiting a sea fort and searching the loading cranes. These specific barrels are always loaded with cooked meat and pineapples. Next, let's talk about fish. These can be caught by using your fishing rod. This can be a great way to pass the time and stock up on resources while you sail. There are a whopping 50 types of fish total in Sea of Thieves, which are divided by 10 different species and 5 different breeds. You can also catch a giant version of each one called a trophy fish. These are the rarest and most valuable. If you want money instead of food, fish can be sold at sea posts to the Hunter's Call faction. Some fish require bait to catch and others don't. You can dig up bait anywhere by using your shovel. Let's quickly look at each species of fish and how to catch it. Splashtails can be caught anywhere but ponds and you don't need bait. Pondies can only be caught in freshwater ponds and you don't need bait. Islehoppers can be found around any large island and don't require bait. Ancient scales can only be caught in the Ancient Isles region, and they require leeches as bait. Plentifins are found in the shores of Plenty region, and they need earthworms as bait. Wild splashes are found in the Wilds region, and you'll need earthworms as bait. Devilfish are only found in the Devil's Roar, and you'll need grubs as bait. Battlegills are fish attracted to danger. They are found in the waters near skeleton ships, active skeleton forts, the Fort of Fortune, or the Fort of the Damned. You'll need to use grubs as bait to catch battlegills. Wreckers can only be found near shipwrecks, and you'll need to use earthworms as bait. And finally, stormfish can only be caught inside the hurricane, and you'll need to use leeches as bait. Now let's take a closer look at bait. There are three types, which are worms, leeches, and grubs. These can randomly spawn in any barrel, or they can be dug up anywhere with your shovel. You might think they're just for fishing, but they can also be used for PvP. Bait only heals 10 health per bite, but you can hold 10 bait total. This means that even if you run out of food, you can always heal yourself back to full using bait in an emergency. That's why I always recommend keeping 10 bait on you at all times. Eating bait also causes you to vomit, which can blind your enemies when it hits them. Eating bait to vomit during a fight is like using a flashbang in this game. Vomit can also be saved in your bucket for later, or used to put out fires. And now you're ready to be the best chef on the Sea of Thieves. Here's 10 tips that every new player should hear. I've been playing Sea of Thieves on a controller since 2018, so here's my best advice for new PS5 players. Number 1. Don't double gun until you're ready. The aim assist on controller is kind of doo-doo. This is why most console players prefer using a sword and a gun as their loadout. Now if you watch any PC streamer, you'll notice they always double gun, but this is because they have a much easier time landing shots consistently. If you can't land shots consistently yet, you should not be double gunning. Double gunning will not be forgiving to you if you miss a single shot during PvP. I highly recommend you incorporate a sword in your loadout if you're trying to understand the basics of PvP. This brings us to tip number two. Don't let anyone shame you for your loadout. Using a sword with a blunderbuss is the loadout that people will hate you for the most. But use whatever you want to use. There's literally only six weapons in this game. I just want to warn you in advance that people are going to be mad at you for using a sword, even though this is a pirate game. The toxicity is just unavoidable. Number three, you can absolutely master cannons on controller. Despite guns being a little harder to aim, PC players have no advantage over you when it comes to cannons. You're on an even playing field, which is why it's absolutely worth practicing your cannon aim as a controller player. Number 4. You need to use a high sensitivity for PvP in this game. If you're used to a lower sensitivity in other FPS games, you'll need to bump it up significantly for Sea of Thieves. Enemies will be running in circles around you and jumping over your head, so you'll need a high sensitivity just to be able to keep up. Number 5. A lot of new players don't understand that stealing is not toxic in Sea of Thieves. It's actually a huge part of the open world experience, so do not take it personally, but do stay alert and prepared. You should always be watching the horizon for pirates coming to rob you. Assume that every ship you see is hostile, and prepare to defend your loot at all times. However, you'd be surprised at how many crews actually do want to alliance with you, especially Xbox players. It's time to end the console war. We're just happy to not be the only console players in the community anymore. Whether you're stealing from the other ships in your server or alliancing with them, the point is that Sea of Thieves can be whatever you want it to be. Everyone plays with a different goal, but just know it's not always a friendly one. Number six, know that Sea of Thieves has lots of registration issues, which are especially bad on console. This is referred to as hit reg or hit regging. 
It's important that you understand this so you aren't freaking out and panicking when your enemy survives a fatal shot. Don't assume that they're cheating or that the fight is unwinnable, it's just hit reg. And for some reason, it's way worse in this game than any other game I've ever played. Number 7. Don't play crossplay servers until you've learned the basics. This game has a crazy skill gap. Do not expect to win a fight against an experienced Xbox player, a PC player, or a larger crew. We have all been playing this game for literally 6 years more than you, and have perfected the PvP and naval strategies. Don't jump straight into crossplay servers and get discouraged. Instead, you should practice your naval and PvP strategies and get the basics down, and then try a challenge. Number 8. Because this game has a crazy skill gap, the only way for you to learn and get better is by taking on every fight you can. Attack every ship you see, whether it's skeleton NPCs or real players. But go into the fight expecting to learn instead of expecting to win. Use every loss as a learning experience instead of just getting pissed off. Number 9. Don't play Sea of Thieves alone. This game is not designed to be played solo. Whether you win a PvE, PvP, or both, you'll enjoy yourself much more with friends. Every aspect of this game was designed for gameplay with teammates. Even playing with just one other person in your crew will make Sea of Thieves feel like a completely different game. Matchmaking with random fills is pretty fun, but you should also join my Discord at the link in the description if you want more friends to play with. And finally, number 10. Watch my guide where I break down the best controller settings you should be using. The video is linked in the description. In this video, I'll show you how to beat every world event in Sea of Thieves. World events are high risk, high reward battles open to the whole server. You'll see which world event is active by looking up in the sky to see a glowing cloud. World events drop large amounts of valuable loot, but it's risky because the whole server may fight you for it. Remember that world events also scale in difficulty to your crew size. Now let me tell you how to beat each one. First is Ash and Winds. You'll notice this world event by the red tornado in the sky. This event is a boss fight with one of the four Ashen Lords. You may fight Red Ruth, Old Horatio, Warden Chi, or Captain Grimm. They have many special attacks. This includes breathing fire, summoning skeletons, throwing fireballs, jump attacks, and the dangerous ground pound. At the end of the fight, the Ashen Lord will summon lava rock to fall from the sky and will boil the water around the island. Make sure your ship isn't parked too close to the boss or it will sink. The Ashen Lord has three lives. In between each life, this boss will fall to the ground defenseless, and you must quickly go land hits on him. The best way to beat this boss is with a sword or by sitting back and sniping at him. An important tip is to keep moving at all times. If you stand still, this boss will kill you very quickly. After defeating the boss, he will drop an Ashen Wind Skull. This can be sold to the Order of Souls or you can use it for PvP. It works like a flamethrower. It doesn't deal a lot of damage, but it does light a ship on fire pretty quickly. Next is the Skeleton Fort. You'll recognize it by the Skull Cloud with thundering green eyes. Skeletons in the guard towers will begin shooting at you as you approach the fort, but you'll need to sail your ship straight into the cannon fire and get as close to the island as possible. Think of this like the Normandy invasion. Once you get close enough to shore, you should be in the blind spot of their cannons. Next, you'll complete 12 waves of skeletons. The skeletons that will kill you the most are definitely the ones carrying lit powder kegs. You'll also face golden skeletons that are immune to sword damage, and plant skeletons that heal from the water, and also shadow skeletons which are invincible in the dark. At nighttime, you'll need to raise a lantern near these skeletons to make them vulnerable. The best way to deal with most skeletons is to sword dash. This should one-tap them. However, you'll need a gun to deal with gold skeletons and the ones carrying powder kegs. You'll find several ammo chests around the fort. There's always one on the bottom floor of the fort, one on the second floor, and at least two around the outside. Skeletons will also drop you ammo pouches to pick up. After beating the 12 waves, you'll face your first boss fight against two Ashen Captains. Finally, you will reach the final boss fight round against the Skeleton Lord. You might face the Duchess, the Mutinous Helmsman, or the Two-Faced Scoundrel. They have several special attacks, including a powerful ground pound and the ability to summon more skeletons. Once you defeat the boss, he will drop the vault key. Use this to unlock the treasure vault under the fort. But an important tip is to always check if an enemy is pulling up on you before you unlock the treasure vault. You can always sail away with the key and come back later if you need to. Actually, a pro tip for every world event is that you should always be checking the horizon for enemy ships sailing towards you. No one should be catching you off guard. The worst is if a ship catches you off guard while you're fighting the boss. 
Now let's talk about the Ghost Fleet. You'll notice this world event by the large green tornado in the sky. You'll see tons of hostile ghost ships circling the tornado. You'll have to defeat four waves of them to win. These ships will fire special ghostly cannonballs at you. This includes phantom cannonballs, flame phantom cannonballs, and the screaming wraith ball, which is the most deadly because it can open up four holes with a single hit. Keep your eyes peeled during the fight because some of the ships you beat will drop supply crates for you. The final boss ship is the Burning Blade. After beating the boss, he will drop special ghostly loot and the cannonball crate of the damned which contains ghostly cannonballs for you to use in PvP. Next is the Fort of Fortune. This is like the Skeleton Fort, but it's way more valuable and challenging. You'll notice this event by the glowing red skull cloud. Like the last world event, you'll need to clear many waves of skeletons, but you'll notice there's way more keg skeletons and golden skeletons in this event. Here's some tips for dealing with gold skeletons. Did you know you can dump water on them to make them rust and weaken? Firebombs are also super effective against them. However, the fastest way to clear gold skeleton waves is to use powder kegs. The final boss fight will be against one of the Ashen Lords. This is a dangerous boss that can breathe fire, cover the island in smoke, and even cast down volcanic rock. The boss will drop a key you can use to unlock the vault in the fort basement. You can find really good loot in this world event, but prepare to be attacked while you do it. Next is the Skeleton Fleet. You'll notice this world event by the ship cloud with green thunder in the sky. This event will always spawn in the center of the map, and you activate it by sailing inside the boundaries of the fleet. You will fight three waves of multiple ships at once. When fighting the sloops, you should focus your fire on the skeleton on cannon. This way he can't shoot back at you and he'll sink very fast. A tip for dealing with the galleons is to remember that skeletons cannot bail water. They can only patch holes. This means you can actually board the skeleton ships, and then you can stop them from repairing so they sink faster. It's also important to remember that you need to fire at the lower deck of a galleon to fill it with water. This fleet can be deadly, and it's easy to get overwhelmed by cannon fire, especially because these ships will also fire cursed cannonballs at you. My advice is to play it safe. You can always sail out of the world event boundary if you need to repair your ship, and then just sail back inside to finish the fight after you're under control. Don't stay in combat if your ship damage is getting out of control. Each skeleton ship you defeat will drop a little loot for you, but the final ship will drop the big stack of loot. There's also a version of the skeleton fleet called the Fleet of Fortune. You'll notice it by the Red Ship Cloud, the Fort of the Damned. This is the most valuable world event right now and the most highly contested. You'll notice this event by a skull with flashing red eyes. The Fort of the Damned is a world event that can be player activated. You'll need a Ritual Skull to start it. You'll also need to die six different ways to collect the different colored flames from the Fairy of the Damned. Once activated, you'll clear 14 waves of skeletons. Weaken each color of skeletons by exposing them to one of your different colored flames. The Ghost of Grey Marrow is the final boss. Once you beat the boss, he'll drop a key to unlock the treasure vault. You'll find rare loot inside and lots of explosive kegs. It's common for players to save up on Ritual Skulls so they can stack this fort many times before finally selling. You'll also commonly see alliances of many crews doing this fort together. This is by far the riskiest world event to do, but the loot is worth the risk. The last world event is the Kraken. In between world events, the Kraken will pick one ship on the server to attack. You'll need to shoot down enough tentacles to make the Kraken retreat before it can sink your ship. You'll be hit with three different attacks, including a tentacle slap, the vacuum cleaner, and the chokehold. Use your cannons to take down each tentacle one by one. Finally, I want to talk about sea forts. These are not a world event, but they function similarly to a skeleton fort. There are six of these sea forts on the map, and they are occupied by hostile phantoms. You'll need to take down several waves of phantoms before finally reaching the boss wave. This boss will drop you a key which unlocks the treasure vault in the basement. If you search the fort, you can also find a key to the treasure vault on the top floor. Sea forts are a quick, easy, and fun way to get loot. And that's every world event in Sea of Thieves. World events have always been the most fun part of this game. It's the perfect bridge between PvE and PvP. You can make money and have an epic battle with the whole server. You can scheme up a plan, you can pull off sneaky steals, and you can make or break an alliance. World events are Sea of Thieves at its absolute best. Here are the best settings for playing Sea of Thieves on a controller. First, scroll down to the captain's permissions and turn on the only setting you see here. 
This lets everyone in your crew customize your ship instead of just you. This means all your friends can buy different cosmetics and add them to the same ship, so you get more bang for your buck. Next, let's look at gameplay settings. Under input, you want the setting called Reduce Hold to Interact turned on. This will make using anything on your ship feel much quicker. But you should keep the second option turned off because this will lock you into aiming down sights. Next, turn on the last two settings here to make sure you don't accidentally emote or open a cosmetic menu during combat. Now scroll down to the very bottom and turn on Server Authoritative Hit Markers. I literally don't know why this isn't turned on by default. It basically means that the game won't lie to you. It will only show you hit markers that the server registered correctly. Now let's talk about graphic settings. Immediately increase your field of view to 90. I promise you this game will feel unplayable on anything less than 90 FOV. Below that, you'll see a setting called Disable Screen Shake. Make sure you turn this setting on. This will make aiming with your cannons way easier and smoother. You'll be able to fire and adjust your shots without seeing an earthquake. Next, let's go to the Input tab and scroll down to Controller Sensitivity. I play on a 7, and I would not recommend that you go lower than a 7 because PvP is very fast-paced in this game. Enemies will be jumping over your head and running in circles around you. You'll definitely need your sensitivity on a 7 or higher just to be able to keep up with their movement. Your dead zone should be on a 0.2 or lower. Your response curve should be at a 3 or lower. My aim sensitivity is a 5.5 for the blunderbuss and flintlock, but I do go a little higher on the eye of reach so I can quickscope. Now if you scroll down you'll see aim assist settings. If you plan on doing mostly PvE then you'll definitely want this turned on because aim assist is extremely strong against NPCs. However, if you're doing PvP, the aim assist will feel completely different when fighting real players. A lot of controller players absolutely hate the way the aim assist feels in this game and actually do better with it turned off. If you like PvP, then turning on aim assist is going to come down to your personal preference. Try it out and see what you think. But you have been warned, aim assist feels really weird in this game compared to others. Next, let's talk about keybinds. All your supplies can be accessed through your radial menu, however, there are three special things that you'll want to keybind. These are throwables, food, and planks. Bind all three of these to your d-pad. Binding throwables is especially important for being able to pull out blunderbombs quickly in the middle of combat. There's a special reason why your food needs keybound, which is that this is the only way to quickly cycle through all your different food options. If you're only using the radial menu to eat food, then you can't easily select a particular healing item. This leads to frustrating moments where you're wasting a pineapple to heal 20 health. Simply bind it to your d-pad. You'll want planks bound to your d-pad because milliseconds count when you're rushing to save your ship. And that's all the most important settings you need for playing Sea of Thieves on a controller. This is your complete guide to sailing the sloop in Sea of Thieves. Sailing a ship by yourself can be intimidating, but here's my quick and easy guide. Let's take a look at the sloop and break down the basics. In this game, you have to treat your ship like you treat a woman. Um, you want to tell me what you mean by that? No, actually I think we should move on. If you want to start moving, the first thing you need to do is raise your ship's anchor. Next, you'll find two ropes on either side of your ship. The flat looking one controls sail length, and the round pulley is your sail angle. Drop your sail using the flat length rope, and you'll start moving. The more you raise your sail, the less wind you'll catch, and the slower your ship will move. A very important tip is to never drop your anchor. Instead, slow your ship by raising your sails when you want to glide to a stop. Or you can just half raise your sails if you want to move slowly. And remember, full drop your sails if you want to go fast. And if you're anchored, your ship cannot move at all. You should really never be anchoring yourself, you should just control your speed and stop with your sails. The anchor of your ship is really only going to be used by your enemies when they board your ship and want to stop you. But what if your sails are fully dropped and you still want to go even faster? This is where you can use the round sail angle pulley to catch wind. While you're using this rope, if you look straight up in the air, you'll notice white streaks showing you the direction of the wind. Angle your sail so the wind is hitting directly into it and you'll get a speed boost. Here's a chart showing you how to angle the sails on every ship type to take advantage of the wind. You should screenshot this so you can remember it. Now let's take a look at the wheel. This is where you'll spend most of your time while sailing. On a sloop, you can turn the wheel a full rotation until it stops to make the tightest turn possible. On bigger ships, the wheel will take more rotations to turn completely. If you want to sail straight, you'll need to line up the tallest wheel peg right in front of you. 
your controller will actually vibrate when you're perfectly straight. A super cool feature in this game is the map table, which basically functions like a GPS, telling you where your ship is moving on the map in real time. Use this to easily check if your ship is pointed in the right direction, and even plan out the islands you want to visit in advance. On the sloop, you can look at the map table just by looking over the back balcony. After glancing at the map table, simply look at the compass next to your wheel, and make sure your ship is traveling in the right direction. Now here's some pro tips for turning your ship. The more your sails are raised, the faster you'll be able to turn. For example, if your sails are fully raised, then you can turn your ship the tightest and quickest. Whereas if you try to turn with full drop sails, then you'll make a big slow circle. If you're in danger of ramming your ship into something, simply raise the sails to slow you down and give you a tighter turning radius. If you're really in an emergency, you can also perform an anchor turn to rotate your ship 180 degrees backwards. To perform an anchor turn, simply crank your wheel all the way to the side and then drop your anchor. You'll notice there's lanterns everywhere, but you'll actually want to turn all these lights off if you want to keep your ship more hidden from enemies. Lantern light really stands out on the horizon, and it might lead enemy pirates straight to you. But what if you're actually looking for a fight? In that case, you're going to use your crow's nest. Climb up to the top, and then use your spyglass to scan the horizon for ships. The crow's nest is also where you'll find your flag customization chest. This chest is also where you can offer or join alliances with other crews. Now let's talk about harpoons. Two harpoon guns can be found at the front of your ship. These have many uses. You can make tight turns. You can pull your ship into the right position when you want to park. You can harpoon loot to move it to your ship quickly. And you can even pull enemies onto your ship during PvP. Now let's talk about all the different supply barrels on your ship. The red barrels are where you can store cannonballs, throwables, and other ammo types. The brown barrel downstairs is where you store wooden planks, and the yellow barrels on the side will store your food. You can deposit supplies into all these barrels by hand, but if you have a storage crate, you can hold it up to these barrels and move supplies around much quicker. The lower deck is also where you'll find your grill and all your cosmetic customization chests. Now I'm sure you're feeling confident and you're ready to take on some pirates. But suddenly, your ship starts getting destroyed. Everything is broken and you're filling with water. Don't panic. It's time we discuss how to manage repairs. The only way your ship sinks is if the water level reaches your top deck. You'll hear a very distinctive noise when the water level starts getting close to sinking. It sounds like this. There are three levels of holes your ship can receive, called Tier 1, 2, and 3. A Tier 3 hole lets water in the fastest, and it takes the longest to repair. Stop your holes from getting bigger by patching them before damage is taken again in the same spot. The fastest way to bucket water in a sloop is by standing right here. Don't panic if you start filling with water. No matter how bad your ship looks, just remember that it only takes 5 buckets to bail your ship completely dry. Unfortunately, your ship can also take damage on the top deck. The wheel, anchor, and mast can all become broken, but every single damaged part of your ship can be fixed with a simple wooden plank. However, if your mast breaks and falls, you won't be able to patch it until you first raise it using the sail length rope. Here's a pro tip. If you notice your mast falling, you can actually catch it before it falls by hopping on this rope early. This is referred to as catching the mast. After your mast is fully pulled upright, simply nail a single plank on it and you're ready to drop sails again. There is another way your ship can be damaged, which is fire. Kegs and firebombs will start fires that will quickly engulf your entire ship if you don't put them out quickly. If you need water, you can access the water barrel on the bottom right side of your sloop. Another pro tip for managing fire is that you can stand directly on the fire and dump your water bucket directly onto yourself. The water will put out the fire on both you and the floor around you with a single bucket. I know all this information can feel overwhelming, but I promise all of this becomes easy to remember once you've done it a few times. The challenge of sailing in this game isn't remembering what to do, as much as it is knowing how to multitask everything that needs done. If you're good at multitasking, then you'll be great at ship combat in Sea of Thieves. In the heat of battle, you'll need to simultaneously be adjusting your ship's speed, the angle you're turning at, the direction you're heading, and shooting cannons at your enemy, and fighting off players who board you, while simultaneously bailing water and repairing holes while simultaneously also refilling all your resources from the supply barrels around your ship. As you can see, multitasking and good teamwork are how you master the combat in Sea of Thieves. The skill gap in this game is massive, but it feels very rewarding when you practice and get better.
The most important thing is to not be scared or discouraged. Use every fight as a learning opportunity, and you'll be amazed at how quickly you pick up sailing skills. And that's all the basic information you need to know for sailing a ship in Sea of Thieves. Did you know there are 100 islands to explore in Sea of Thieves? This includes 25 large islands, 39 small islands, 7 outposts, 8 sea posts, 10 strongholds, 6 sea forts, and even uncharted islands to explore. Here's your complete guide to the world of Sea of Thieves. The map is split into 5 main regions, so I'll give you a quick tour of each one. The first region looks the coolest, or perhaps the hottest. The Devil's Roar is the volcanic region stretching down the right side of the map. This place is filled with large rocky islands resting beneath active volcanoes. The Devil's Roar is dangerous, difficult, and risky to even sail through. Setting foot on any of its islands is deadly because of the many active volcanoes. These will erupt every few minutes throwing out explosive burning volcanic rocks. These rocks will instantly kill you, breaking your ship and lighting fires. When the volcanoes erupt, they also kill you by boiling the water around the area, even the water leaking into your ship. Additionally, the earthquakes make walking difficult, and geysers will launch you into the air and kill you from fall damage. And of course you'll find the usual NPC enemies here, like skeletons, phantoms, and ocean crawlers. I would not recommend traveling to this region as a new player, but as dangerous as the Devil's Roar is, there are two benefits of going here. The first is that you can do special ashen voyages here to find valuable ashen loot. This treasure is high risk, high reward. Second is that this region is the only place where you can hunt for the rarest loot item in the game the elusive Box of Wondrous Secrets. It can spawn randomly in this region, but few players have found it here. The Devil's Roar is the smallest region with only one outpost, one fortress, and no sea forts. But there are 14 volcanic islands to explore here, if you enjoy being burned alive. The second region is the Shores of Plenty, which is supposed to be the calmest, easiest, least dangerous part of the world. Officially, this region is under the control of the Merchant Alliance this part of the map is supposed to look like the Caribbean during the Golden Age of Piracy. You'll notice you're in the Shores of Plenty by its light blue water and lush plant life. You'll find two outposts here, being Sanctuary Outpost and the giant town of Port Merrick. This is definitely the coolest outpost in the game, and the most fun to explore. There are three fortresses in this region. There are also two sea forts and two sea posts in the Shores of Plenty. You can explore 17 uninhabited islands here. This region definitely feels the most piratey of them all. Everything you see just makes you feel like you're in a Pirates of the Caribbean movie. The third region is the Wilds, and this place looks like the complete opposite of the last one. The Wilds is supposed to be cursed and dying. It's dark, cloudy, and depressing. Instead of tropical jungles, we see dead landscapes with washed up sea monsters on the beaches, and shipwrecks everywhere. The water here is dark greenish yellow. In the lore, this whole region is supposed to be haunted, which is why it's under the control of the Order of Souls faction. You'll find two outposts here, which are Galleon's Grave and Daggertooth Outpost. You'll also find three fortresses, two sea forts, two sea posts, and 16 uninhabited islands in the wilds. It's not the prettiest part of the map, but I do like the scary haunted vibes. The fourth region is the Ancient Isles, which is the most beautiful part of the map. According to Rare, this region was inspired by the Indiana Jones franchise, and it should give a feeling of adventure and exploration. You'll notice the sunny skies, dark blue water, massive rock structures, and even cave systems on the islands. You'll also notice artifacts and monuments built by ancient tribes all over the place. Officially in the lore, the Ancient Isles is currently under the control of the Gold Hoarders faction. There are two outposts here, which are Plunder Outpost and Ancient Spire Outpost. You'll also find three fortresses, two sea forts, two sea posts, and 18 abandoned islands. And finally, the fifth region makes up the center of the map. There are three important islands here. The first is Reaper's Hideout, which is where the Reaper's faction must go to sell their loot. There's a giant underground base at Reaper's Hideout as well. In this region, you will also find the Fort of the Damned, which is the only player-activated world event. And finally, you'll find the Sea Dogs Tavern here, where you can compete in the obstacle course. This whole central region is where most of the PvP fighting occurs, as well as the Skeleton Fleet world event. If you're trying to hide your loot from greedy pirates, it's best to travel along the sides of the map instead of through the middle. Sweaty players will usually sail around the middle region to see if they spot their next victim. If you sail to the edge of the map, you'll reach the deadly Red Sea. The sky will turn black, and the ocean will turn to blood. Sharks will circle you in the water, 
and holes will start opening up on your ship. Sail too far out and you will sink. This is definitely the scariest way to close off the edge of a map I've ever seen. You'll notice there are always two hurricanes moving around the map at all times. These should be avoided if you can. The wind will slow your ship, lightning will strike you, and the waves will break open holes. The storms absolutely suck, but you have to admit they look pretty cool. The last thing I want to mention is world events. There will always be a world event active somewhere on the map. You'll notice it by looking up at the sky and seeing a weird cloud. These clouds will draw in players from all over the map to fight each other and steal the loot. If you ever look up and don't see a world event cloud, it means the Kraken is hunting someone on the map. And I still haven't even mentioned everything that's under the ocean for you to explore. You'll find coral reefs, caves with puzzles for you to complete, and lots of sirens to fight. It's crazy how much there is to discover both above and below the ocean. The size of this open world is absolutely insane. But what's crazier is how much effort and detail was put into designing each and every island. This game is actually beautiful and exploring each region feels like walking through a work of art. The best part is that this game really rewards you for exploring and visiting islands on your journey. If you look on the beaches of any island you pass, you'll spot washed up supply crates, treasure, and rowboats. Stopping at islands to explore is actually a fast and free way to stock up on resources for your journey. And that's all the basic information you need to know before starting to explore the world. If you found this guide helpful, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, Captain Squiddy. Also, shout out to Biffa the Knight for letting me use his footage. His channel is dedicated to exploring the map and finding the most beautiful parts of every island. Go check out his channel because his videos are like a nature documentary, but for Sea of Thieves. His channel is linked in the description. Shout out again to Biffa the Knight for making this video possible. In this video, I'll show you how to Death Spiral in Sea of Thieves. This is one of the most essential skills to learn if you want to master naval PvP. The Death Spiral is used in the end game of fights to finish off your opponent. But before you can Death Spiral them, you must first immobilize their ship. You'll want to start by anchoring them or dropping their mast. Or ideally, you will have done both. Your opponent will be in survival mode, trying as hard as they can to repair their ship and start moving again. Your mission is to keep constant pressure on your opponent and overwhelm them to complete the sink. This is where death spiraling comes in. You must circle your opponent's ship to open up as many holes as possible. And you will also need to gatekeep their mast from being repaired. The idea of a proper death spiral is that your ship will sail in autopilot. Death spiraling is the art of finding the perfect combination of sail height and wheel turn to put your ship in the perfect orbit. Your ship will sail itself while you can focus on using the cannons and boarding your opponent. So now let's talk about how you death spiral. Let's say you just dropped your opponent's mast. The first thing you should do is fully turn the wheel to begin circling around the enemy ship. And you should half raise your sails. This slows down your ship and makes it easier to maneuver. Now you should be able to straighten out the wheel just a little bit. If you are very close to the enemy ship, you have a tighter orbit, so the sharper you'll need to turn the wheel. By contrast, if you are very far away from the other ship, then your orbit is larger, so the wheel will barely need turned at all. The closer you are to their ship, the tighter your wheel should be turned with your sails half raised. You want to be close enough to land shots with ease, but not so close that your ship is easy for them to board. The best option is to be somewhere in the middle. Don't panic if you mess up the death spiral. You'll definitely need to hop back on the wheel and adjust it a few times until you get the perfect autopilot orbit. Once you have the perfect orbit figured out, the other ship is pretty much screwed. If you find yourself accidentally ramming the other ship, then it's definitely because you're moving too fast and you need to raise sails more. The slower your ship is moving, the easier it is to react and adjust the wheel if the course of your orbit is off. Death spiraling is very hard to master. You're always under pressure when you're trying to start a death spiral, because your opponent is simultaneously trying to fix their ship and escape you. Don't get discouraged if you mess this up the first 20 times you try it. I promise it will get easier each time until you finally understand how to do it right. This is definitely the most important naval technique to learn, so it will definitely feel rewarding once you have it down. The key is to practice so you get super comfortable with it. And you can even practice this just by circling rocks or tiny islands. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe. I'm posting new PvP guides every day.